slide. Um, so as I mentioned, I work with the Public Good Projects on the Life Unites Us campaign. Um, and the Life Unites Us campaign is a campaign to reduce opioid stigma, um, use st stigma across Pennsylvania. We can flip to the next slide. Um, so this campaign, we are using utilizing a contact-based approach, meaning stories from people, shared by people, and sharing them with other people. So this campaign is really only as successful as the community partners that we're able to engage in this effort. So we're so grateful to have you all on the line today to help us with this journey. Um, our intention is to find people who are ready to share stories either of recovery or as an ally to someone in recovery to record their stories and then share them on our platforms and also share them with you and with our other community partners who are engaged in this work um, so that you can share it back with your communities that need to hear these messages. So if you want to hop to the next slide. So our partnership opportunities, we believe that recovery is not only possible, but probable with all of your support. Um, so we'd love for you to join us. And really all that takes is a commitment to helping us share stories and, and recruit members from your community to, to share their story. Um, so we, as a campaign, are recording all of these stories and putting them together, and then we want to be able to deliver them directly to you to then share with your platforms. Um, we're also making some fun, exclusive partner resources, images to share on social media around uh, stigma reduction um, and other things. And, and also these webinars are for partners. So we also ask for feedback from our committed partners around how did you like the webinar? What do you want to see next? Um, we really want this campaign to support the work that you're already doing. So my email is there on the bottom um, and feel free to reach out with any questions, ideas, um, all of that good stuff. We will also share a little survey at the end of this webinar. So get excited for a, an official way to share some feedback. Um, the other thing that my role in, involves is engaging directly with partners. So I've had the opportunity to get to know some of our community organizations across Pennsylvania in conversations all on the phone because we're all, we're all distant right now, um, but getting to know some of the work that's going on throughout the state. And I'm really excited to invite one of our partners to share a little bit more about what she is working on and kind of what um, the priorities for her organization. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jamie Drake, and she is the SCA Director of the Carbon Monroe Pike Drug and Alcohol Commission. Um, Jamie has worked in the drug and alcohol field for 30 years, and five of these, these years she's worked in a residential treatment facility. Um, she's been at the Carbon Monroe Pike Drug and Alcohol Commission for the last 25 years as the primary counselor, supervisor, treatment program manager, and now as the executive director. Um, so I'd love to, the carbon, and they're, they're, what they believe in over at her organization is a comprehensive, supportive, and effective approach in dealing with substance use disorder in our society. Um, so she's going to share more about her experience with stigma and advocacy and recovery work. So I will pass it over to Jamie. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, so really, I want to start off, like, what does advocacy really mean to me? It really is to me fighting for the individuals I serve publicly every day. Um, it really includes a lot about relationship building, being out in the public speaking, um, presenting the facts, and doing a lot of awareness campaigning. So um, first off, you know, talking about looking at dealing with um, our local, state, and federal officials, um, we do a lot of outreach to those individuals. We invite them to all of our um, task force meetings as well as our recovery events ask them to be a part of those events, share, speak, but then also be there to hear the stories of those people in recovery that they may not otherwise hear. Um, we, I really try to focus on finding champions um, amongst those officials. Um, and we, we've been very successful in that, in, in that they also reach out to us, um, you know, 
our one of our state representatives, he'll call me on his way driving to Harrisburg to ask me opinions on things because we've built those relationships. So, you know, to me, that's one of the biggest things that I think, you know, needs to happen is take the time and go visit those people in their offices. We go out, um, we do that once a year and we present all of our statistics to them. So they, they really know what's going on in the community. I go to our commissioner meetings and present trends on a regular basis to keep them informed of, of what's happening as well. Um, and really making myself available to them at any point in time that they need information, I think is, is very critical as well. Um, also attending the statewide advocacy days that occur, not just attending them, but ahead of time, I will reach out to, the, to our, our officials and ask if I can come stop in and meet with them while I'm there. I'll also personally invite them to come to the programs that are going on. Um, you know, not just assuming that they're going to show up, um, but you know, encouraging them to come and be a part of it with me. Um, another big thing I, I look at when it comes to, the, to stigma and advocacy is that um, utilizing the media. I regularly, I'm on our local uh, TV station as well as in the newspaper with anything we have going on, making sure it's getting out there into the public, um, what's happening in, in their community so that they know it. Um, also, even when seeking people from my board of directors, I'll really look for those people who are out in the community who can help to, to spread the message. Um, I don't claim that I can do this by myself, and I really try to get as much of a team behind me um, to help do this. As well, our opiate task forces are very critical in this. We um, have task forces in all three of our counties, which are made up of various stakeholders, community members, family members, and um, we use them as well out in the public um, to, to speak and tell their stories. I really encourage individuals that are in recovery to share their stories of recovery. And in doing that, I try to provide them as much of a supportive environment to make sure that happens. Um, we have a certified recovery specialist that works for us that does a lot of that. Um, we go out into the community to do that. We go to the local schools to talk to the kids in hopes to change the perceptions of young folks um, going forward in the way they think about substance use disorders. Um, we also um, do a lot of campaigns through the PA Stop over the years. And with that, we have kind of plastered as many messages as we can around um, in the community for people to see. So, you know, anyone can become addicted kind of messages, um, breaking in the connection between prescription drug abuse and um, heroin. Also, um, encouraging people not to care enough not to share your prescriptions. So how we've done those things is we um, have done uh, gas pump toppers, where when you pull up to get your gas, you'll see that. And we include our 24 hour toll free number on that then for people to reach out to us. We do grocery cart inserts. Uh, we've done traditional billboards. We have posters out with local uh, people's faces on that have been impacted or have passed away from overdose um, with our referral center pads on those. Um, we also sponsor the footballs for all of the uh, high school football teams in our three counties for the cheerleaders to throw out with those same messages on them um, so that we get out to the general public what's, what's really going on. Because again, if, if it's not right in front of your face, you don't have it in your family, you may not um, really see what you need to see. So we, we try to really um, focus on that every year. We also every year put Christmas trees in our local hospitals with um, again, messages on the trees as well as little tags for people to take off and get um, access to our 24-hour hotline as well. Um, every year our staff comes up with a shirt that we, you know, wear that might sound simple, but with about 50 staff members that are out in the community wearing positive messaging shirts about um, recovery. Um, we also changed our voicemail messages so that when someone calls and gets our voicemail, they hear that, you know, on it we say, like, your recovery matters to us, you know, so that's, you know, even getting that message back to those folks. Um, we, we also um, are developed the recovery simulation, which is probably our most exciting recent thing. And we haven't been able to roll it out yet because of COVID, because it will involve being in about 50 people together. But in that, um, it is basically to put somebody in the life of somebody in early recovery and what they go through and all the places they have to be and how they're treated when they go those places. Um, as a non-traditional way to put somebody right, kind of um, instead of doing a survey or something like that, it puts them into the situation and they see how people feel and the barriers that they have to um, deal with in order to try to 
um, continue on in their recovery. Um, so like in closing, I, I just would like to say like, you know, for me, it's about passion and, and it's, it's something that, you know, I feel I've, I've developed a hard skin. Like, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't bother me to go to the grocery store and have people say, oh, there's that drug lady or, you know, I kind of find it funny at this point. Um, but my, you know, my, my whole thing is like, somebody has got to fight for these people. And, um, I think my staff does a really great job of doing it. So thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Those are really, um, you can hear your passion in, in all the work you do and such creative and, and powerful ideas for spreading the message. So thank you for sharing. Thank you. Um, and our next presenter, I'm excited to also bring to the stage is Courtney Hunter from Shatterproof. Um, and she is going to share with us today information on how on advocacy and how you can advocate for addiction reform um, and really make sure that the work that you're doing lasts beyond you. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Courtney. Thank you. Um, thanks, Maddie. My name is Courtney Hunter. I'm the vice president of state policy at Shatterproof. And um, uh, I know a lot of the folks on the phone just uh, through my previous work at Partnership for Drug-Free Kids. Um, I saw Keegan's name, so shout out to Keegan. Um, and uh, Jamie, just thank you for, for your presentation and for all the work that you're doing um, at the state. Pennsylvania is no doubt um, full of committed and passionate individuals uh, that are fighting for recovery and for addiction reform. Um, and I just, I wanted to, to shed light on that and also share that um, just in my work across states, uh, across the country, Pennsylvania really stands out. And, uh, and that's because of all of your work on the ground. So thank you. Um, many of you might already know who Shatterproof uh, is and who we are and what we do. Uh, just as a level set, I um, wanted to, to share that we're a national nonprofit dedicated to reversing the addiction crisis in the United States. Um, we are focused on ending the stigma of addiction and also ensuring that treatment in the U.S. is based upon proven research. Um, and I am a member of the, the policy and advocacy team, and we are really fighting um, to eliminate stigmatizing policies at the federal level and also at the, at the state level. And I thought it would be a good idea today, um, instead of talking about and spending time on how a bill becomes a law and what the differences are between allocation and appropriation, um, on what those policies are and why it's so important that we are all united um, and collaborating in breaking down those barriers. Um, because a lot of the policies that are in place are not based on science, uh, they're based on stigma. And um, so I wanted to, to share a little bit about that today and you know, just look forward to, to your feedback and having a conversation. Um, this is just a map of uh, where Shatterproof has worked um, with states to change policies in the last eight years. Um, before we get into that, also wanted to share, um, many of you know this just from being on the ground, but just to reiterate, the scope of the problem in 2020. What are we facing right now? Um, we already had a, a dire uh, addiction crisis and the pa pandemic has just exacerbated the current crisis. Um, we know that disruptions to treatment plans um, has really increased the risk of relapse. Um, we also know that times of unemployment um, and uh, economic hardship are associated with uh, drug use, addiction, and, and also um, just mental health issues. Um, Wellbeing Trust uh, estimated that there will be a, a, around 75,000 additional deaths um, due, to the, due to the pandemic in this time of um, really deaths of despair. Um, uh, and finally, I um, participated in a stimulant summit this weekend, and um, they shared, you know, something that might have you might know, um, but really interesting to put numbers around. You know, why are we are we seeing this huge surge in overdoses, suspected drug overdoses, um, you know, during the pandemic versus this time last year? And part of the reason um, could be that fentanyl has. Um, infiltrated the stimulant supply um, 
from about 7% in 2018 to about 22% this year. So that's pretty significant um, and, uh, and also pretty, pretty frightening in terms of the supply issue. Um, and I, I don't share all of this to be, you know, depressing <laughs> um, or to reiterate, um, you know, what, what we all know about this disease and the work that we're doing every day, um, but to really sound the alarm um, that we need to all answer this call and, and really work together in a collective way because um, the problems are, if we don't do that, the problems are really insurmountable. Um, and so, you know, our policy priorities are really um, integrated into to three separate categories. One is payment. We know that um, families go bankrupt from putting um, a child into treatment. Um, we know that um, it's, it, it is just an impossible process and that um, we need to make sure that insurance is really removing barriers that are, um, that are actually killing people, um, like prior authorization and step therapy, step therapy requirements. Um, you know, put while those processes are taking place on the insurance side, um, that could prevent someone from getting care. So we need to remove those barriers. Um, the second is is training and education, making sure that addiction is really brought into the medical mainstream and that we're treating this from a professional standpoint as the disease that it is. Um, and finally, we're very focused on the opioid litigation and um, making sure that these dollars are used for evidence-based programs. Um, I won't go too much into this today, but the tobacco settlement dollars were completely squandered. Um, only about two to three percent of those dollars were spent on tobacco prevention and cessation program programming um, over a 20 year period. And that is just abysmal. And we cannot let that happen uh, with the opioid funds. And so we're committed to, to, holding, um, to holding those companies accountable and, uh, you know, and making sure that history doesn't repeat itself. Um, so these policy priorities and advocacy priorities really aim to reduce the treatment gap. We know that only one in 10 people will receive addiction treatment. Far fewer will receive treatment based on research like medication. Um, and this number hasn't really moved a lot in recent years, even though the scale of the problem has gotten um, uh, so much larger. Um, and it, it, the current federal and state policies, the insurance coverage, as I mentioned before, they're really rooted in stigma, not science. And um, from my perspective, that's really why the, the treatment gap remains as, as, large, as, it, um, as large as it is. Um, and um, also improving payment. Um, like I said before, too many families go bankrupt. Um, we're still these expensive treatment facilities usually offer um, usually offer services that are not evidence based that um, have nothing to do with medical treatment. Um, and we're sort of forced back into this process of going back into treatment or not getting into the right level of care. And so how do we reverse that process? How do we fix the system at a state and a federal level? Um, a couple of things that we can do to improve, improve payment and that we're already doing um, at the state and federal level, making sure that we can cover medi medications for addiction treatment through Medicaid, removing um, pre-authorization requirements, uh, working with commercial insurers um, to cover medications without pre-authorization. This might sound really basic, um, but it, some of the stuff has even been legislated, but we we have to then go back and actually track if it's happening. And anybody who's dealt with, um, you know, payers, and it's really hard to find this information. And so um, we need to do the work to make sure that they're um, actually committed to, to removing these barriers. Um, there are also Medicaid waivers available um, through um, CMS 1115s for behavioral health to really help expand treatment recovery services um, at the state level. And um, something you know we're also fighting for and, and working with Friends of Recovery um, and other recovery groups is recovery for um, or coverage, pardon me, coverage for um, peer recovery support services within Medicaid. 
um, and also family support services. We know that these sort of ancillary wraparound supports are a critical, a critical component to the success of um, evidence-based treatment um, and improve outcomes. So how can we um, make sure that, you know, peers are supported, um, that we can scale those programs because they're working? Um, so that's, would love to connect with you all um, if somebody's interested in, in that um, in Pennsylvania. Um, we're also working to, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, um, develop alternative payment models. So what is that benefit design at the managed care level? What does that look like? Let's get in the weeds <laughs> and make sure that um, those payment models really reflect um, uh, reflect uh, a need for evidence-based and quality care and really incentivize providers and systems uh, to provide that care instead of, you know, just getting somebody out the door um, and offering them a service. What it, how does that relate to outcomes um, and how do we improve that process? Um, I cannot believe I'm still talking about this, but 12 years after the Parity Act passed, um, we still have major enforcement issues with uh, the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, um, mainly because it was a federal law and uh, insurance is, is mandated and regulated at the state level. So um, now we have to go to every state and make sure that consumers are protected, that the benefits within their insurance plan actually are at parity or equal to um, the, the benefits for medical and surgical plans. Um, and we did just have a big success this year in California. We passed probably the most um, stringent parity bill um, at a state level. So, um, you know, there is, there is hope and I think that's really gonna improve um, care for people and um, increase what insurance can, can provide. Um, when I was just talking about integrated payment models um, and improving payment, when you all are advocating at the state level for addiction reform, um, I think you know these are the key components here. What does this look like? What is what is practical? Um, and we really feel like an integrated care model. Um, integrating primary care and behavioral health care is how we're going to move the needle on this um, issue. And um, one model that we've really looked at and kind of settled on is the collaborative care model. Um, it has been used and um, there are codes in, in CMS for a number of years, um, really utilized in the mental health space. And what got me so excited about this is that 50% of people who have a mental health um, disorder also have a comorbid substance use disorder. So there's a huge opportunity to address um, really these behavioral health issues in a primary care setting um, and begin to start treating the disease of addiction at stage one and not at stage four in the emergency rooms, which is what we're doing now. Um, Pennsylvania is actually one of 15 states that covers the collaborative care codes within Medicaid, which is wonderful, and they're doing great work. Um, this is what I was mentioning at the top of the call. Pennsylvania is really leading the way. Um, and what we can do in the, in the state is really talk about how do we expand this to addiction providers? How do we get um, medication, MAT providers, um, to, to utilize this model um, model more. It, it has about um, 70 randomized clinical trials, so really proven health outcomes. Um, and the other thing that was so exciting to me about this is, you know, 80% of patients who are receiving behavioral health care do so in a primary care setting. Huge opportunity to, um, to connect these folks to services and evidence-based care. Um, and it's really a missed opportunity now, um, but this is a reimbursable payment model um, that, that allows that to happen. And um, the second priority as addiction advocates um, in this space for reform is improving training and capacity. We know that, you know, insurers come to us and say, 
Um, you know, there's no, their network adequacy is a problem. We don't have enough providers, uh, you know, able to, um, to provide care. Um, so how can we work with them to really improve capacity? Um, and something that we're working on is, you know, training all healthcare professionals in the state um, in addiction care, um, using telehealth models. And unfortunately, the pandemic has uh, allowed for telehealth to expand, fortunately and unfortunately. Um, we've seen that telehealth has been really great from a patient standpoint. Um, No-show rates have really decreased. So um, whether that's because there's less stigma, whether it's because of the convenience, um, so we need to be supporting those models and, and making sure that we can, um, you know, reimburse for those and providers are, are incentivized to do telehealth um, for behavioral health care, including induction of medication. Really important. Um, just like with we, we would have with any other disease that really um, improves our capacity. Um, and finally, we need to keep pushing for, you know, improved reimbursement rates. I wish we could just get more people to be addiction medicine um, doctors, but um, as we know, the reimbursement really, really drives um, a lot of the care decisions in this country. And um, so we need to be working and, and fighting to increase those reimbursement rates. So there's incentive there um, beyond, the, uh, beyond the greater good. Um, and then two pieces of federal legislation that really I want everybody to be aware of so that in your fight as advocates at, at the state level, um, you can really tout these two bills because um, they're gaining a lot of traction and they have a lot of hope. Um, so uh, one is the Medication Access and Training Expansion Act. Um, and this is, would require doctors um, who prescribe uh, controlled substances to receive a base level amount of addiction training. It would also um, allow for them to receive uh, the waiver requirement and mandate that they receive the waiver requirement within medical school. Um, and the second, which I think we need full court press on is the Mainstreaming Addiction Treatment Act. Um, and this would remove, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, we're, it would remove the uh, Data 2000 X waiver. Um, and that is the, the waiver requirement to prescribe buprenorphine. So it's this extra level of training that physicians, um, or actually prescribers, um, DEA prescribers have to obtain in order to prescribe medications for addiction treatment. We don't have this for any other disease. We can prescribe opioids, um, but we can't prescribe the medications to treat opioid use disorder without a separate level of training. I don't know how this makes any sense within the current opioid epidemic. Um, and you know, we've seen that when these barriers are eliminated, like in France, fatal overdoses decrease dramatically. This is a tool that we have in the toolbox. We need to get rid of this waiver requirement now and expand access. Um, we know that only about five to six percent of all prescribers nationally have taken the waiver requirement um, and have have you know are able to prescribe. And we know that only half of those are actually prescribing, um, and that's about three percent of all prescribers nationally. This is abysmal. This is one of the most evidence-based treatments that we have to fight opioid use disorder, to end stigma, to bring addiction into the medical mainstream. We would treat any other disease with medication um, and you know, with, with other therapies, and, um, and we should be doing that for addiction to save lives. So um, I'm hoping that this will gain some traction in, in 2021 and, um, and hopefully pass to, to improve treatment. Um, and, you know, finally, I just wanted to, I know this was a lot of information, um, I wanted to say that we have um, on our website a way for advocates to weigh in with, with both state and federal officials on a, on a number of issues, um, some of which we discussed today with regard to increasing access, improving payment, um, uh, insurance coverage for addiction treatment, um, and really removing the stigma and eliminating these barriers. Um, so I hope that helps in terms of, you know, what the priorities are um, as addiction advocates and 
can have us really um, singing off of the same song sheet um, because I think the more that we're all together and collaborating on what the priorities are um, and the less you know bifurcation there is among amongst advocates, um, the more traction we're going to have in in making these changes that are critical critical to improve access and care um, for for those struggling with SUD. Um, we also have a state advocacy toolkit that does get into more of the nitty gritty I was mentioning about, um, you know, sample op-eds. Um, what's the difference between allocation and appropriation of funds? Happy to talk about that at any time. <laughs> um, or, you know, the specifics of uh, the different issues, how to tell your story. Um, and I do just want to um, leave with this. Some of the folks on the call I've, I've been to DC with or have been in state meetings with. And I think it's it can be really um, you know, intimidating, even in this world where we're not meeting in person. But I want to share that um, your tax dollars uh, pay for their work. And as a constituent, um, you have every right um, to go in and meet with them and share what matters to you um, and what uh, what reforms need to take place. Um, and we can help you with that with that messaging. Um, and you know, I think once you do it, the comfort levels there, um, and then you can do more of it. But um, big or small, there's lots of ways to weigh in, whether that's signing a petition, sending a letter, um, you know, posting on on Twitter. Um, or going to a meeting or sharing an op-ed. There's lots of different ways to get involved um, and be an effective advocate. So um, with that, I will turn it back over to uh, the team at Public Good Projects for, um, for questions, concerns, expressions of outrage. Thank you, Courtney. That was an incredible overview. Um, clearly you've thought a lot about this and done a lot of work. So um, thank you for, for your insights there. Um, so now is the time to pop some questions into the chat box. Um, I see that we have one question that already came in. So any, anyone else feel free to pop those in there while, while we're taking this one. But this first one um, is around ethics in exploitation of vulnerable populations. So how would you recommend addressing negative long-term effects um, a person with opioid use disorder can experience from sharing their stories, especially our younger, most vulnerable populations? So when we're thinking about advocacy and um, you know, sharing stories, how can we protect um, more, more vulnerable populations? Courtney, do you have any thoughts on how you've done that in the past or kind of tips for that? This is a, a really... Um... I'm not sure I totally understand the question because it's a really well thought out comprehensive question, but um, my, you know, my response, um, Johnny, would be um, that the more that we normalize evidence-based treatment, the more that we can bring um, addiction into the medical mainstream, that we're treating it um, you know, in primary care practices, that we're offering medication, that the level of education is there for medical professionals, just like it would be for diabetes or any other chronic condition, um, the more we're going to, to get at those longer term effects and protect the next generation. Um, I, I hope that answers your question, but... Um, I also think it's just, it's important to share stories and that also helps break down the stigma as we know. Um, but having an open and honest conversation with young people about your own experience or the experience of others um, is, is gonna help normalize the disease. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And just to speak from the, a campaign perspective, we we as a campaign are recruiting stories and actively asking folks to share their stories. However, we are also very clear with people um, that we encourage them to be getting the support um, that they need in order to share a story. Not everyone needs to share a story to show that they are making progress in in their recovery or um you know sharing a story is not for everyone and, and we're very aware of that and i think it also um speaks to 
the, a larger issue of needing to advocate for more resources for this, that um, it's not just about this moment of what you see as kind of the most dramatic recovery moment. It's a long-term process and there are long-term effects that need long-term support and full funded, fully rounded out support. So um, I think this is a really important topic to bring up in these advocacy conversations is we're not only sharing this story for now, but we're also looking at data from all these other people of how this affects people long-term. So um, that's a great point. Thanks for thanks for bringing that to us, um, Johnny. Stigmatizing language. Let's talk about that. Um, stigmatizing language in and outside of the field continues to be a real challenge and barrier for some access to treatment. So how do we as practitioners work within our organizations and agencies to encourage that we are a solution and not part of the greater problem? Um, Courtney, any thoughts on that question? Yeah, I mean, it's something at Shatterproof we talk about a lot. And I think leading by example is um, the advice I would give for any advocate, use the right language um, that reflects that addiction is a disease and not a moral failing, because we know that to be true. Um, at the federal level, what we're, we're trying to advocate for actually um, is um, getting rid of some of the, or changing some of the federal um, organizations, names that really reflect that it's a criminal problem, <laughs> um, such as uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Um, can that be the National Institute of Drug Addiction? Um, and so that actually takes an act of, of Congress um, to change that, but maybe that would make a huge statement in terms of the changing the discriminating and uh, stigmatizing language and, and breaking down some of the policies that really reinforce that stigma. Um, and so I would say use your voice and continue to lead by example um, in terms of using the right language. Um, and we're gonna help try and elevate that as much as we can. Yeah, that's a, a great answer. Um, and kind of related another question here about, do you think that stigma affects the reasoning for some of Pennsylvania's strict drug and alcohol confidentiality laws? Um, yes. <laughs> Short answer is yes. Um, this, because of the way that our um, policies um, treat people who use drugs um, from criminalization to um, taking drug tests um, to for employment um, to noting if you've um, been convicted of a drug related conviction on a job application. These are all policies that reinforce stigma um, mm -hmm. and not the fact that it's a disease. Could you imagine a world where you had to put on a, on a job application um, if you had HIV or if you had diabetes? Um, that wouldn't happen and people would be outraged. Mm -hmm. um, and we need that same level of, of outrage. Um, and we have it. I, I think it's, you know, it's there, um, but it's complicated by the systems that are in place. These are massive institutions that are just entrenched in these existing policies. And so how do you uproot that? Um, and my answer is always, you do it from multiple angles. <laughs> you do it from grassroots, you do it from federal, you do it from the back door, you do it by screaming at the top of a building. We need a comprehensive solution. We need to be singing off the same song sheet um, and be aware of what those priorities and issues are um, that can help change that infrastructure. And it's not gonna happen overnight. But the little things that we're, we're doing that might seem like little things at improving access, improving um, uh, evidence-based treatment, removing restrictions and barriers, um, it's all working to that same end. Um, I, hope, I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you. Um, and this is sort of an expansion on a, of the previous question, but um, do you see a need for advocacy work around kind of education on MAT um, within 12-step communities um, and, and sort of specifically around MAT? Is there advocacy work that needs to be done there or education work? 
Um, yeah, absolutely. I'm just also looking at um, Bill's, you know, uh, question, and, and thank you for bringing that back to um, to the confidentiality piece. I'm sorry, I, I didn't address that. Um, you know, we got rid of in January um, earlier this year the the 42 CFR Part Two um, uh, confidentiality regulation, and I know that people are some people are conflicted about that, and it's it's was used to protect people um, from discrimination, um, but also really bring addiction into the medical mainstream and have um, all physicians and all practitioners um, understanding what you know, the risks are from a medical perspective, if you're doing surgery on someone who's um, has a history of addiction, right? So um, I think that that is the federal law. Um, and then, you know, from a state perspective, um, I think it's, it's good to get rid of those confidentiality regulations, um, because that doesn't help us move forward from a stigma perspective. Maddie, I'm, I'm sorry, couldn't, um, <laughs> yeah, another question. No, that's okay. The, the one, the other question is just around, um, advocacy work around MAT specifically and sort of education around MAT, especially within like 12 step communities and, and other recovery communities. I, I think, um, you know, the important thing here is that, um, there are so many different pathways to recovery mm -hmm. and, we know that there's good evidence um, for medication, so we need to expand access to that. Um, and if somebody chooses to do that with their provider, that's great. Um, but we also, um, you know, shouldn't discredit anyone else's journey or pathway to recovery if that was through or is through 12 step or AA. There actually is some good evidence now on, on AA um, and NA. Um, and so, you know, I think um, they need to expand their also acceptance that MA medications are, you know, a part of the recovery journey for a lot of people and are really effective. So we shouldn't be judging each other on those different pathways to recovery. And um, just like uh, I keep comparing this to any other disease. Um, you know, if somebody uses medication to recover from a disease, does that make them less strong? Does mm -hmm. that, um, no, I, I mean, I don't think so. Certainly not. Um, and, and so I think more education is, is needed there for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's a specific question around um, harm reduction as a key component to um, advocacy. And do you know of any advocacy efforts that are in support of harm reduction expansion? Yeah, well, um, uh, many of you might be aware of the recent law that passed in Oregon that decriminalizes uh, all drugs, all substances. And um, this is going to be interesting to see what happens here. Um, uh, they're also taxing marijuana legally and having that money go to uh, drug treatment programs and addiction treatment programs and recovery resources. Um, so there's there is a movement, I think, through Drug Policy Alliance and, and Harm Reduction Coalition at a national level to really push some of those policies. Um, you know, uh, the classification of drugs at a federal level, I think is going to take longer. Um, and my sense is that, you know, the movement um, toward more harm reduction efforts is, is going to happen at a state level. Um, but there's really what what I'm, I'm supportive in and, um, you know, anybody else at, at Shatterproof um, can share wherever the evidence is, whether it's a harm reduction policy or a non-harm reduction policy is where we should be looking. Um, and, you know, there's really good evidence in syringe exchange programs um, and, you know, and some other harm reduction efforts at actually getting people into treatment um, and keeping people safe um, in the process. So um, I think, uh, I think we're going to be seeing more of that to come. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great um Great example to, to look at there. Um, all right, let's see more questions here. 
Um, okay, how does getting rid of our confidentiality rights help those of us facing discrimination? Well, I don't know that it's a matter of getting rid of your confidential confidentiality rights or, or not. You still have the ability of whether or not to share that you're struggling with addiction or not, or that you're in recovery or not. Um, but if you, uh, you know, my sense is that if legally it's still kept in the, um, in the shadows as a, as a disease, um, then we're not going to ever get rid of discrimination. Um, that, you know, if we, um, if we continue to keep it confidential and in the shadows, um, then we can't really work toward um, normalization. Yeah. But I'm not an expert on this. So everybody is entitled to um, please learn more about why we have confidentiality rights. Hey, Bill, um, you can email me and we can talk about it. <laughs> you have my, my contact. <laughs> Um, any other questions? I'm also going to um, just pop in the chat. I mentioned that there would be a survey for everyone to take. Um, so I'm just gonna add that link into the chat box right now. Um, we'd love your feedback and any other questions we didn't quite address. My email is there. Um, and there's also a form for anyone that's interested in becoming a partner to fill out and we will follow up with you. Um, Oh, it looks like we have one more question coming in. Where do you see the role of family in, in advocacy? Um, role of family is, is huge. Um, you know, anyone who's, who's aware of, um, uh, who's been familiar with addiction um, knows that it's a family disease. And we know that the conventional wisdom of kick your kid out, let your loved one hit rock bottom, uh, tough love, we know that none of that works. And we know that um, when it can be also really frustrating for the family uh, to deal with somebody who has uh, addiction or behavioral health issues, who, who um, doesn't want to adhere to medication, who doesn't want to go to treatment. Um, but we know that people fare better, that recovery outcomes are better when family members are involved. Um, so we need to be supporting um, uh, efforts at the federal and the state level to have funding for family support services. Um, I actually, I wrote a bill that just passed the house um, earlier this year called the Family Support Services Act for Addiction Act. Um, and that would provide a $25 million grant program just for family support services for addiction. Um, Cause we know how important this is. So I would encourage everybody to write your senator um, and tell them to pass that legislation too, um, because that would funnel down to the states um, and support programs of loss, family therapy, um, craft, MI, um, and all of these different interventions and support services for families. That's great. That's really great. Um, oh, it looks like someone, thank you, Keegan, for sharing sharing um, that bill in the link or in the chat box there. All right, well, lots of good stuff in the chat. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, definitely reach out to Courtney or myself um, if you have any more questions about the campaign um, in general. And we are happy to have had you all here today. So with that, we will wrap things up a couple minutes early, but um, thank you all for being here. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Go eat some potatoes. <laughs> All right. Thanks all.